everyone. Um, I think the, the, uh, this presentation is going to be rather different from the one we've had uh, so far. Uh, nevertheless, when I received the invitation to give a presentation here, there were some general statements on uh, the need to go to basic ideas of self-organization at the core of uh, complex systems theory, and I think this is the context of uh, this presentation. And uh, what I'll try to do is to give uh, some snapshots of uh, uh, questions, concepts, models, uh, to see which of them uh, capture your attention, and uh, then we can uh, discuss on them uh, later on. Uh, now, the topic I've chosen is this, uh, this thing that I've called uh, social consensus, because I think it is uh, a very uh, paradigmatic, uh, simple example in which one can understand basic ideas of, of self-organization in a social context. So, first thing is, what is this thing of, uh, of uh, a consensus, or what do I mean by a consensus problem? The idea is simple, is uh, uh, determine when and how the dynamics of a set of interacting units, that I will call agents, uh, that can choose among several op options, that can be political options, uh, opinions, cultural features, whatever, uh, when these dynamics lead to a consensus in one of these uh, opinions, or when a state with several coexisting uh, options prevails. So, when the system is able to self-organize itself in a common, uh, in a common state, in a common uh, opinion, uh, to give an, uh, an example, or when, uh, I mean, the, the dynamics that lead to the, uh, to the coexistence of several of these states. Now, what are the ingredients that uh, determine what is the outcome of the, of the problem? Uh, the, the ingredients are the interactions, and interactions have two, uh, two components. One is what is the mechanism of interaction, so what is the rule, how an agent interacts with another agent, and second, the network of interaction, so who interacts with whom. Then, very briefly, here you have uh, uh, a table of, of a few of the models that have been uh, used, and each of these models just implements a different mechanism of social interaction uh, as a separate one. Of course, in reality, many of these uh, uh, compete. Uh, a basic one is this uh, mechanism of imitation. If you want just the behavior of teenagers or of uh, brokers in a stock market, I just copy what someone else is, is doing. Uh, that goes under the name of voter model for historical reasons. And this is one of the of the things, of the models I, I will use. And so the, the question is, if we have uh, a set of, of, uh, of agents that interact just via imitation, I imitate randomly one of my neighbors, and I have two possible states, when this will lead a self-organizing phenomena in which everyone will end up in the same state? It is a clear uh, question, and the answer is not that. Uh, that is it. There are other models here. I will also elaborate later on this actual model of cultural dynamics, which is based on a mechanism of homophily. Just to, uh, to tell you which are these uh, very simple models uh, of consensus with two options. I was uh, referring to this uh, voter model, and I will compare it with another one that comes from physics, but it is just a, a, a mechanism of, of, uh, of majority of social pressure. Imagine there are two options, blue and red, and uh, I'm here, and uh, those are my neighbors, and I have to update my state, okay? One possibility is I randomly copy the state of one of my neighbors. This is imitation. That means that this will go to the, uh, uh, to the uh, red option with probability one-fourth, or to a blue option with probability three-fourths, okay? This is imitation. A different thing is social pressure. Since the majority of my neighbors are blue, I will go with probability one to the state blue. That gives rise to different type of dynamics. Uh, I will not comment on that, but just you know, to throw it on the table if someone wants to discuss it later. There are all type of models in which agents at the individual level can have coexisting options. Not, it can be not either A or B, but can be A and B. Uh, this has been used in examples of uh, bilingual agents in competing languages, but I'm sure someone here in, uh, in uh, his or her laptop has both the uh, uh, Linux and Windows uh, operating system, and then he can work with two. 
and then the competition of these two, uh, the, the, uh, the influence of these agents, which play the two roles at the same time, is also uh, interesting. Now, uh, the other thing is, uh, the, the, so those are mechanisms of interactions. The other thing is who interacts with him, the complex network. At least since, uh, since Monday, no one has talked here in any detail on, on, uh, on complex networks, so very briefly. The, the basic idea is that the complex network is the skeleton of, of a complex system. Uh, individuals are, are uh, the nodes, and the edges or the links they are who are connected with whom. I have some non-regular connectivity, and this has been used as, uh, as is well known in the modeling of many types of biological, technological, social systems. Main ideas that concern typically three, uh, three issues. What is called the small, the small world phenomena, what is called the scale-free networks, and the mesoscale, mesoscale structure, the idea of communities. Just examples for those of you who are not familiar with that, with the idea of a small world and uh, scale-free. Uh, the idea of the small world as, uh, as made popular by Bats and Strogat is you start with a random network here, uh, uh, with a regular network, and um, you just uh, delete with some probability one of these links and rewire randomly on the network. Okay. Doing that, you go from a regular network to the limit when this, this rewiring is done with probability one to a random network. Which are the difference between the regular network and the random network? In a regular network, you have a very high clustering, so locality, and at the same time, you have a long distance between any, any two nodes. The random network is the contrary. You have uh, low clustering and very low distance. In the middle, this, this is a small world phenomenon, for intermediate values of P, in which you have still locality, so high clustering, but the distance, average distance between two nodes is, is low. The idea of, uh, of uh, scale free networks, uh, one can define that as networks in which uh, the probability for a node to have k links follows uh, a power law. Uh, that means that you have uh, a node with uh, many different uh, number of links, in particular some nodes with a very large number of, of links, and those, those play the role of a hub, and this have some importance. Okay, so those are the ingredients of the interacting uh, agent models. There's the mechanism, and I will talk about this uh, model, which is just pure limitation. And then the who interacts with whom, the heterogeneity in the type. Uh, there are two things. One, the, the network might be complex, and second, the ties are not persistent. If the ties are not persistent, you have some coevolution. There is another point. Again, I just throw it on the table, but I will not elaborate on that is when, does, when one uh, uh, makes simulations or modeling of that thing, there is the question of when do elements interact. And that goes, I mean, in most models uh, implemented in a computer simulation, there is a constant rate of interaction. But this is not the way humans behave, but there is uh, heterogeneity in the timing of individual activities. Those are uh, data, for instance, of uh, SMS uh, sending between two individuals in, uh, in one day, uh, blue and red, and you can see that goes into bursts. The same is true for uh, inter-event time distribution for calling activities with, uh, with uh, mobile phones, and, and I mean there is a, a, a broad uh, evidence that the interaction it is not at a constant rate, and this is something that has to be taken into account in these models. Uh, there is the question of the origin of this uh, heterogeneity and the consequence. As I say, I just throw that on the table so, as an ingredient. I will not, I will not uh, elaborate that. So, what I want in terms of questions is to address uh, three questions. One is the uh, role of the of the network in this problem of consensus, and I will use for that this model of imitation. Second question is the, the dynamics of the network, the fact that the ties are not persistent. And uh, at the end, I would like to say a few words on uh, the idea when I am talking about social consensus of the competition between self-organizations or imposed organizations by some external driving signal. So for the first one, uh, uh, which is this, uh, this uh, Bolter model, as I said, it is uh, it's a question of, uh, I have, uh, 
a note here, an agent that has this opinion uh, uh, read, I look at a label, I just copy red. Now look at another label, it is uh, green, so I copy green. Just imitation, okay? Um, uh, and again, the question, to repeat myself, is when and how one of the two absorbing states in this uh, thing, all uh, red or all green, is uh, achieved and the effect of the network of interactions. This is a formal definition uh, on how one can measure the idea of, uh, of, uh, of the growth of order, of how the self-organizing uh, uh, system uh, uh, grows the different opinions. And the idea is just to count the number of links uh, among nodes which are in different states. Those are the active links. So uh, the, the links connecting to uh, agents which are in a different state. Of course, when consensus is reached, this goes to zero. And on a random situation, it is of the order of one half. So the evolution of this quantity tells me how order is established or not in the system. Um, just this, uh, if any one of you wants to, to play with this uh, model, we have on our web page this applet that should come out. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. For some reason it is going slow. Okay. Uh, here you can uh, construct different types of networks. Let's construct the, uh, the uh, uh, small world network. You start from a one dimensional regular network. You make some rewiring, as I said, with some uh, probability. Well, that was uh, one rewiring, if you rewire all. This is, the, uh, this is the network. Now you set opinions. Some of the nodes are uh, blue, some of the nodes are, uh, are red. The uh, black links are the ones which connect uh, nodes with a different uh, opinion. And then you just implement this interaction of random imitation. And you see how the system evolves. You have here the blue links connecting blue and blue, the red links connecting uh, red and red, and the, and the active links, the one that connects uh, uh, nodes in different state. Well, it takes quite a while to get anywhere. It stays there. And that might be considered counterintuitive, because if you do the same thing in a regular network, it, it goes rather fast to a consensus state. And it happens here that in spite of having these long-range links, you don't get to that consensus state. This is the fact. Now, What's the purple one? The purple one is the one connecting the, uh, uh, now we are, yeah, we've reached now finally the consensus state. It's the one that connects uh, nodes in different states. Okay, the active states. <coughs> okay. So uh, you can play here with different, uh, with different, uh, uh, Net goes and so on. Now, this is a technical uh, uh, transparency, but it's just to, to give you the results. If you play this game in a regular network, either in one dimension or in two dimension, this quantity, which measures the uh, average number of links among, state, among nodes with different states, it goes to zero with a well-defined power law or the inverse of a logarithmic. So that means that the system is ordering. It is ordering because there is an unbounded growth of domains on one of the two opinions. And that happens in a regular network, and this can be done mathematically. A regular network of dimension uh, less or equal than two. But if you go to a, the, a network of high dimension, and complex networks are, in a, in a sense that I can be precise if needed, uh, of high dimensionality, what happens is that if you do a run of this simulation, counting these uh, uh, links, uh, number of links among, uh, among nodes in different states, it goes to a sort of plateau value, and it stays here for a very long time. In fact, mathematically, if the system is infinitely large, it would stay here forever. It just happens that due to finite size fluctuation, it goes to zero. The inverse of that thing tells you the uh, average size of the ordered domain, so the, the, uh, the domain in a given uh, of one of the, uh, of the two states. If you do that in, in, in many of these uh, random, in, in many of these runs, what happens is that each of these runs 
will go to the uh, consensus state in a in a different uh, in a different random time, and then you can, on the average, define a, a survival time that goes scales with the uh, number of nodes in the network, so that if the network becomes large, it will not reach consensus in a finite time. Okay, so. Uh, Again, this is, is technical, it's just to, to tell you that for a very large number of networks, which are uncorrelated networks, this plateau which is achieved only depends on the average number of links per node. So, to summarize, uh, okay, yeah, uh, summarize role of complex uh, networks in this imitation model. In an imitation model, if the network is a complex one, uh, uh, the system does not reach consensus in the limit in which the system becomes uh, very large. And the ordered, uh, and the ordered uh, domain depends only on the average number of links per node. And as I said, this is somehow counterintuitive because when you do the same thing in a, in a simple one-dimensional, two-dimensional regular network, the system reaches consensus. So self-organization depends in a in a very critical way on the, on, the, uh, on the network on which the interaction is taking place. Now, second question I wanted to address is this thing of coevolution, and that will, I will profit here to introduce a, a different, slightly more complicated model, which is this idea of coevolution. When, when people talk <coughs> of dynamics of networks, two or three things can be meant. The first one is dynamics of network formation. So how a network is created, how a network grows. So the, the, it's a structure in, in social science which is created by individual choices of actions. One creates this social network. Second point is dynamics on the network. This is what I've been doing uh, so far. I have a network which is fixed and the actions of the individuals are constrained by the social network because you can only interact with your neighbors in the network. Okay? Now, politically, sometimes the first thing is, uh, is look at a right-wing view of uh, social dynamics because you know, we have free will and we are able to create the social network we want starting from scratch. The left-wing wing, left wing view is that we are born where we are born and that the social structure uh, constrains all our social activities and type of things that we can do. Of course, there is a, a third way, which is the coevolution of the agents and the network, so that the, in a sentence, circumstances make men as much as men make circumstances. So, what is the final goal here? The final goal is the understanding dynamical processes of group formation and social differentiation. So the network is evolving in the same, in the same time scale in which the agents of the network are changing state. And so one tries to understand which is this, uh, this, uh, this idea of, of group formation. Now I put this uh, transparency because there were some uh, discussions here, some emergence and I like this paper by, by Phil Anderson back in 1972 in which uh, he elaborates on the concept of immersion and uh, being a physicist makes clear that, uh, that the uh, reductionist hypothesis is not something we are against it or we are not against it, but it does not imply by any means a, a constructionist uh, hypothesis. And uh, how at each level of complexity new properties appears uh, they give some examples that were discussed here the other day. But the important thing in the context of what I'm talking about is what is distinctive of emergence in human social systems. And this is, uh, some people call that second order emergence, or some people call downward causation. The, the idea is that uh, humans recognize the emerging structure and react to the global structure. And this is something that not happen, does not happen in, in physical or in technological systems. So our individual actions lead to an emerging structure, but this structure are the matrix in which action takes place, but this action maintains and changes the structure. Is this coevolution in the same time scale. Uh, when one talks about this coevolution, the generic result that one finds is that, the, uh, that there is a transition in which the network fragmentates and groups appear. 
This uh, has been demonstrated in this minimal Volter model that I've talked about, but I'll, I'll uh, profit the opportunity to introduce this other model of uh, cultural dynamics to tell you how this uh, network fragmentation occurs here. Now, what is this model of, uh, of Axel Rudd? Axel Rudd is a political scientist from the University of, uh, of Michigan that published back in 1997 in, in the Journal of Conflict Resolution, a rather uh, quoted paper, in which the, the question he addressed was, well, how is it that if by interaction we become more similar, still differences in culture persist for very long times? So the question, and what he proposed, was a model to explore the mechanism of competition, this, this struggle between uh, cultural globalization and the persistence of cultural diversity that he calls polarization. First thing is to define culture. And, uh, and this is defined as a set of individual attributes subject to social influence. So uh, political view, language, religion, hobbies, this is culture. Race is not culture. Culture evolves in a different time scale than genetics, okay? Uh, and uh, his model is based on two principles. The first is, uh, uh, is uh, what is the probability of interaction? And the probability of interaction is larger the, the larger you are similar to your neighbor. So if we, uh, if we both uh, know some mathematics and we, know, and we both speak English, it is more probable that we will interact if, that if we don't share these things. The result of the interaction is that you become more similar. So if we both uh, are able to speak English and know some mathematics, it is more probable that by, by interaction we will coincide in doing some self-organization studies. And his conclusion was that the combination of these two principles uh, produces and sustains uh, this polarization or cultural diversity. May be very brief. This is again technical. The idea is you have agents in a in a in a network. Each agent uh, is uh, characterized by f cultural features, religion, language, whatever, and each of them can be can takes a number of of, uh, of possible values, the traits. And this is an important parameter: the number of traits per feature. The the you have here two two agents. The way they interact, they already share one of these traits. So the probability to interact is one over three, because this is the, uh, the common features. And the result of the interaction is that they become more similar. Okay. Now, what does he find? Let me again show you a small applet. Different colors indicate different cultural states randomly at the very beginning of, of a simulation. They, uh, people here interact with these, uh, with these uh, rules that I've told you. And well, you see that cultural domains are being formed. There is some interaction. Let me go uh, faster. Until it is frozen, it stops. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that in spite of a mechanism that we have implemented of local convergence, because all the mechanism is to so that people become more similar, uh, this can generate global polarization, which is, again, a little bit surprising. But the, this mechanism of self-organization, which locally converges, produces global polarization. Now, um, one can also see that in, in terms of this parameter Q, which is the number of traits per feature, there is a transition such that if what I measure is the size of the largest cultural domain, so that when this, uh, when this size is of the order of the size of the system, we have just a single cultural domain, so I've reached consensus. This is what happens when this number of traits uh, for, for feature is, uh, is small, but there is a well-defined critical value in which there is a transition from this globalization to polarization. So those is just to illustrate how simple mechanisms give rise to sometimes counterintuitive ideas, and there are transitions in this phenomenon. Now, one question is, OK, I have this 
frozen, multicultural, non-absorbing state. Is this robust? Is this resilient? And this was a question that was already posed by Axelrod himself when he said that the most interesting extension, the most difficult one, is cultural drift, models of spontaneous change in a trait. Well, what we were uh, able to show is that those states are not robust, that if you implement some uh, cultural drift, noise, genetic uh, drift, whatever you want to call, this uh, goes to a, uh, to a final homogeneous state, so that this uh, result was not uh, robust. And what, uh, what happens is that uh, this is done in a fixed network, but, but if you allow for the network to evolve on the same time scale that the state of the agents, and this is nothing but the new specification of the concept of homophily, then the transition is robust in the sense that uh, these culturally polarized states are robust versus cultural drift. And this happens because there is a phenomenon of group formation, a uh, fragmentation of the network. So, what is the, the, the idea now? The idea is the same that I was describing for you in terms of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of this model, that you choose a, a link connected to agents, calculate the overlap, the probability of interaction is proportional to how similar they are, and then as a result of the interaction, they become uh, more similar. But now, in this example here, those are nodes those are their cultural states in this uh, formal representation, and the links have some weight. The weight of the links is the cultural overlap. Now, you can take this one, and there is no cultural overlap at all. Then, what happens in this uh, reformulation of the model is that if I, I have nothing to talk with you, I mean, we don't have any overlap, well, I just will break this link, and we'll try to find some other link in the network. And this is this, this thing that I break this link and I create a new link. So at each time step of the simulation, I choose one link in which there is no overlap, nothing in common with my neighbor, and I try to find someone else. This is the result, which is this phenomenon of network fragmentation and recombination. Uh, again, uh, well, what I'm plotting there is this maximum size of the... Uh, of, uh, of uh, homogeneous state as a function of these parameters, which is the number of traits per feature. But the essential idea is that there are two transitions. There is one in which the system goes to a frozen configuration in the network, and all the network has reached the, the consensus. But there is a transition to a fragmentation of the network, group formation, in which each group reaches a particular cultural state, but different from the other group. And still, there is no transition to an active state of the network in which what happens is, is just that the agents are uh, continuously trying to find someone that has some important overlap with them. And so this is a, a dynamic state of the network that stays there forever. Okay? So this is an example of what these ideas of coevolution mean. And then I'll go to the uh, uh, third topic, third question I wanted to, to throw on the table which is this idea of self-organization versus imposed organization, and I'll do that in this same model of, uh, of uh, cultural dynamics. And the, the question addressed here is, okay, uh, I, I, I had this model or these systems, or this system in which agents interact among themselves with these rules, and uh, we were uh, trying to understand if they were uh, self-organizing uh, themselves in a, in a, uh, in a common uh, cultural state or there was some polarization. Now, how is this modified if I have uh, an, uh, an external message, mass media, propaganda, something that is driven the system? How these two things compete? Um, I've written there the two important results so that <laughs> those are clear before trying to to explain them, and those are the, the take-home results. First, strong messages do not homogenize, but rather produce polarization. A very strong campaign of propaganda in any direction produces polarization, does not attract everyone to that message. Second, 
in this competition uh, uh, between uh, local H and H and interactions and the uh, and an external mass message, it can happen that the system leads uh, that the system self organizes itself in a social consensus which is not the one imposed by the external field, and this happens when there are long range links in the social network. So let me try to briefly elaborate on these two things. First, how, do, how does one model these external messages, mass media? There are three things. One is uh, what I call Big Brother, or propaganda, or whatever you want. There is an external message that comes from outside the system. This is what you have to do. Okay? And this is a message such which is uniform for all the agents and it's fixed at all times. Okay? Then there is the idea of what, uh, of what uh, mass media should be in a, democratic, uh, in a democratic society, which should reflect the, uh, the common ideas of the society. So the global media, which is a broadcast, what, what this global media uh, should broadcast is the dominant global cultural trend in the system. So it has to identify which is the, uh, the common the most common cultural trend in the system and feedback it into the system, inform that this is what most people think about it. This can be done at the global level. This is CNN. It is uniform, the same for everyone, time, in, time dependent, or it can be done at a, at a, at a local level, a local TV station or whatever. Now, then the rules of interactions are the same that we had before, but in addition, the agents interact with this message. And the rule is the same. You have to have some overlap with this message to interact with it. Because, I mean, if, uh, if, uh, if you don't have any, any interest in, I don't know, if you don't have any interest in buying cars, because you don't buy cars, you use your bike, I mean, any message about which is the car that you have to buy, that's not influenced uh, to you at all. I mean, you already have to have some overlap. And the result of the, of the interaction is that you, you become closer to this, uh, to this uh, message. Now, <coughs> what happens? Uh, imagine that you have an external uh, B, this parameter B is the strength of the, uh, of the message. So how probable is that, the, that uh, you will get in touch with, the, with this uh, message? Now imagine that I have, in a, I have a situation in which, in the absence of this message, the state that the system converts to a blue state or a blue opinion, but my message is black. Okay, what I'm going to show you is that if the message is, is strong, it will produce polarization, and if the message is weak, it will take the system to converge to the message. So let me show you that. OK, here on your left, this is what happens when you don't have any, any, uh, any uh, external message. The system self-organizes in this blue state, reaches consensus. Now, I'm putting here a rather strong uh, external message. Well, it's already frozen, it has produced polarization. Now, imagine that I do the same thing, but with a rather weak, rather weak uh, message, which I tell you is black. It converges to black. OK? I can. Forget the graph, which is summarizing different things, local, global. Look at the, look at the message. The idea is that, the, that polarization is caused by a strong media. The competition of this similarity rule, you have to be similar to, to someone to interact, applied to agent agent and agent media interactions produces polarization. I mean, this is well known by political parties. Far away from the elections, they give a very strong message in their political view. What they do with that is attract their, the people that think most likely like them, they attract to their message.
But of course, if you are attracting these people very strongly to your message, you are breaking the links of these people with the other people. And so you are producing a polarization because you are breaking the possibility of this agent agent interaction. You are breaking this, this overlap. Uh, so cultural homo homogenization is caused by weak media, and this is something I didn't show, but within this mo model, local media are more efficient uh, in the cultural globalization path than global media. So this is the sentence to summarize. Mass media is only efficient in producing cultural homogeneity in conditions of weak broadcast of message, so that agent agent interactions can be still effective in constructing some cultural overlap with the mass media message. Strong media messages do not homogenize because agent agent interactions become ineffective. That can be called the uh, power of being subtle. Right? I didn't understand now if, if the media, if the parties do know this, why do they send strong messages? They send strong messages in between elections. When they approach elections, the message becomes much weaker. They want to have their people when there are no elections, and when you approach elections, then you have to, you want to have the others. That's my view. I mean, I'm not a politician. And I'm not paid by any political party. So now, this is, this, uh, but I think this is a good example of how self-organization can compete with external drivings. Okay? Now, this was done in a, regular, in a regular lattice, in a regular network. Now, which is the role of the network? Imagine now I, I, I have a, a globally coupled society, means everyone is, uh, is linked to everyone. It's a fully connected network. Okay? And what I'm plotting here is properly normalize the size of the largest cultural domain minus the size of the domain having the state given by the message. Okay? And what you find here is, now put it, there are three regions that you find, depending on the strength of the field and this parameter that I've used to, to measure the number of, of traits per, per cultural feature. A first phase in which, uh, well, the, uh, the, driving, uh, the driving message uh, wins, and so it takes the system to the message it's trying to impose. A third state in which uh, you go to some disordered state, an intermediate one in which the systems the system orders itself, but it orders in a, a state which is different of the one which is given by the driving message. This is possible, and this is just here in, the, in, in this small, small network I, I presented you at the, uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning. Let me try to tell you what is this graph. I'm plotting here the uh, the size of the maximum uh, of the largest ordered cultural domain as a function of this parameter Q. And this is, this would correspond to the regular uh, network, this corresponds to the uh, uh, random network, and this in the middle is this uh, small world network. If you go in this direction, so you are for a given value of the, uh, of, uh, of the field and of, uh, of Q in which the system will not reach consensus, when you start throwing these long range links, and this is varying this parameter P, you will see that the system orders, but the system does not order in the state which is imposed by the field, but, but in a different one which is chosen by the, by the system itself. So there is for some of us, this means that there is some hope than in a, <laughs> than in a society with uh, properly long-range links, the society can choose by itself independently of what it is told to do. Uh, sorry, you understand properly that in small world networks, the phase where the external message is propagated does not exist? Or? No, what, what I say is that when you have these long-range links, and this happens in the small world networks, and if you go to a fully connected network too, mm -hmm. that the system can order in states which are not the one imposed by the external message. Uh, could you show the previous slide? Just that, that 
this the second phase, right? That's second phase two, which appears in a domain of parameters. So, so that phase you also have for a uh, fully connected network? Yes. But you don't have it, but you don't have it for a network of low dimensionality, for a regular network. So you don't have it for a, for a network in which locality is the main thing. Uh, I think I've gone over my time. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's essentially what I wanted to say in, in this thing. The questions addressed are the competition between, in this last part, competition with coll collective social self-organization and, and some external driving force. Two messages, strong messages do not homogenize, rather produce polarization. And second, let me put it that way, there is some hope. And um, as I said at the beginning, I've, I've just thrown on the table snapshots of different ideas, concepts, and just to see which, which of them might be interesting for any of you, and then we can later on continue discussing. Thank you. Thank you.